we have had military leaders as guest speakers here, but we have never had a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Department of Defense and the National Security Council. The top guy. Prior to the Joint Chiefs assignment, our guest today served as NATO's Supreme Allied Commander and as Commander-in-Chief of the United States European Command. He has Illinois roots. He is a graduate of Bradley University with a, you can clap, Alderman. He is a graduate of Bradley University with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. He served in both Korea and Vietnam. Today, he is a professor at Stanford University. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to the City Club of Chicago a man who served as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John M. Shali Kashvili. General? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I truly appreciate this introduction. I have never known a has been introduced with so much gusto as that, Jay, so I'm, I'm delighted. And I thank all of you for this opportunity to uh, come back to uh, Illinois and to, and to talk to you. Um, I must be frank with you that for me to come back to this great state is always something very, very special. Uh, Jay mentioned that I went to Bradley, but there's much more to it than that. Uh, judging by my accent, I'm sure you're aware that I was born in Europe. I was, in fact, born in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, born there shortly before the start of World War II. And uh, to make a long story short, by the time I was a teenager, I had the misfortune of living through the brutal occupation of Poland by the Nazis, uh, the total destruction of my hometown, uh, Warsaw during the Warsaw Uprising and joined millions of, of refugees in those years that were fleeing westward ahead of the advancing Soviet armies. And so the war found us, the end of the war found us in Germany as refugees with literally the shirts on our back and absolutely no idea how to, uh, how to start life all over again. And I was too young to really worry about it too much. I was by that time about a teenager, young teenager. But I'm sure that for my parents, this must have been an absolutely hair-raising thought of you know, how, to, how to reconstruct life again. And then, totally unexpected, uh, clear out of blue sky, a letter arrives from the United States, from Peoria, Illinois. Uh, wanting to know whether we were interested in coming to this remarkable country and start life all over again. And we did. And I cannot tell you what it felt like that, that I guess it was early December day, uh, stepping off the train in Peoria, Illinois, after crossing an ocean and half a continent. Uh, and it was literally a a step into a second life, surely for my parents, but even for me. And what greeted us there is just what you expect. You know, that family that had sponsored us and now embraced us, the town that gave us a job, a home, and asked absolutely nothing in return except that, you know, we accept them as our neighbors and that we call this our new country. And so, 
my roots to Illinois, to Peoria, are much deeper than, than Bradley. And I, I cherish every opportunity to come, come uh, back here. Because the life that we found, I am convinced, exceed anything that you could write in a novel or make into a movie about some immigrant coming to this country and uh, being given all those opportunities to, that, that I was given. So I, I thank you for what this state did, did for us, and I uh, thank you for the opportunity to come back here. Um, let me tell you what I thought I'd, uh, I'd do. Having spent some 39 years wearing our country's uniform and having been fortunate enough, as Jay mentioned, to, uh, to retire as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I thought the most useful thing I could do is give you my thoughts, my private thoughts, on the war in, against terrorism that we're engaged in. And um, most importantly, talk about what I see as the major challenges ahead. And I won't belabor what's ongoing at the moment, because I'm sure, since all of you are the readers of the Chicago Sun Tribune and, and watch CNN and whatever other stations, uh, we've now had, uh, I thought, marvelous coverage of what was going on there. And so you all probably sitting here are better informed about it that, than I am. But just as an aside, it seems to me that in the last couple of weeks, perhaps we have had less coverage uh, of the war on terrorism than we've had before, and partly because there seems to be less of a tempo in Afghanistan. Uh, we have Enron, we have the Olympics, and God knows what else that has replaced the war on terrorism on the front pages and on the evening news. So let me start with a, just a kind of a shorthand what is going on in Afghanistan today, and then really talk about the, the challenges ahead. And maybe um, we have time for one or two questions if, if that fits into the protocol of the organization. So where do we stand today in Afghanistan? Uh, the first thing I would tell you is it's far, far from over. Uh, there are an awful lot of issues still to be resolved, challenges uh, to, to address. We have um, probably roughly about 25,000 people in and around Afghanistan to deal with it. Uh, if you count the ships at sea in the Gulf that support it and other forces that are in a Central Asian republics, uh, the number goes up to about 60,000 or more. So there's still a pretty heavy investment. Um, we don't bomb as much anymore as we did. As a matter of fact, on an average day, we have uh, to, uh, around 90 sorties, that is 90 flights that are conducted every day over Afghanistan. Some 30 of those are uh, combat sorties, that is strike airplanes, uh, fighter aircraft, bombers. Uh, the 60 others are support aircraft, intelligence aircraft, the logistics resupply operations, refueling operations, and so But that gives you some, some idea. But we do still conduct bombing. The other day, you, uh, I'm sure you read and, and saw that uh, we, in fact, conducted strike missions against warring Afghan factions. None of them had anything to do with the Taliban, but those were two competing factions that got into a fight, and the central government in Kabul asked us to, uh, to intervene to get these two warlords to stop fighting with each other. And that still remains a huge problem. Um, we no longer conduct airdrops of humanitarian supplies, but we still provide huge amounts of humanitarian food, uh, clothing, medications, shelter material. But we distribute it now through a large number of non-governmental organizations that are there supporting the a population that is in dire, dire straits. And that, that process, that need will continue for a long, long time. And just as you all and your fathers and mothers were good at serve, sending care packages to those of us sitting in Europe at the end of the war, and I will never forget care packages, by the way. I learned about peanut butter and 
raisins and powdered milk from care packages. Thank you for that. We're going to have to send the son of care packages to Afghanistan for a very long, long time. But that said, what's the situation in, in uh, Afghanistan beyond that? Well, the security situation is that of a country that consists of loosely connected fiefdoms, each one of them ruled by a, by a warlord. Only some of them who uh, recognize the authority, officially recognize the authority of the central government. Um, and banditry, attacks on, on uh, American forces even, and a few Afghan security forces continue. And until there is some kind of a mechanism uh, that, will, that will provide the security and, and bring stability to the region, this, will, this clearly will continue. And that's one of our greatest challenges, is to find some way where someone other than us provides that security and the stability and brings it to an end. And that's why when the president, the interim president of, of um, Afghanistan was in Washington, a couple of weeks ago, his number one request was that the U.S. take on the task of training the Afghan military. Not take the place of the Afghan military, but begin to train an uh, Afghan military. And I'm happy to tell you that that process has started. There is a, there's a survey team in Afghanistan now headed by a General Campbell from Central Command to assess exactly what is needed and get on as quickly as we can to begin to, to um, uh, do training. There's also a uh, international peacekeeping force there led by the British. And that's good, but they are only in Kabul, and they don't intend to stay very long, because they too have the bad lesson of staying too long. And so everyone is putting the faith into being able to build an Afghan police force and an Afghan military, and getting a handle of the war on the warlords, so you can, you can get some measure of confidence that we'll be able to get out of there. Because clearly, our goal ought to be to get out of there as soon as we can do so without everything unraveling. Because I will tell you that the history of foreign forces staying in Afghanistan is miserable at best. Um, and no one in modern times has successfully stayed there very long. Not the Russian, after that decade-long experience there, nor the British, who have fought three wars there, I guess. And there's an interesting story I like to recall from the first one of those British wars in 1850 or something, when they, when they first. And after an extensive time of trying to, um, to establish their sense of law and order and, and, and whatnot, they, they failed. And so, a force of 16,500 British troops began to move out of there eastward in the direction of what is today Pakistan. 16,500. And only one <laughs> made it out alive. Only one. And the British obviously have remembered that. And uh, they didn't fare as badly, but not much better in subsequent wars there. And so we need to be mindful of that. We might need to be mindful also that the neighbors around Afghanistan make this a very, very dangerous neighborhood. And that Iran, that the Central Asian republics, that China and Pakistan have most probably very different ideas what Afghanistan ought to look like after this is all over than do we. And they're not sitting idly by, but you can be assured that they're all working very hard below the surface to ensure that they fashion Afghanistan in the direction it ought to be. And the last thing we wish to do is get entangled. Yet if we were to leave before we've given Afghanistan the capability to take care of themselves, it will take very short time, I'm convinced, for the conditions to reappear again that made possible uh, the establishment of uh, al-Qaeda in that area, and the Taliban for that matter. Now, where do we stand, by the way, with al-Qaeda and the Taliban? Uh, there are still an awful lot of members of the Taliban 
that are in Afghanistan, in various parts of Afghanistan. And every day we continue to search for them and, and try to get a handle on them. But we ought to, be, again, be under no illusion that we've gotten the handle on all Taliban and that we have the handle on all Al-Qaeda. And if we were to leave too soon, it, this, this stuff would reappear again. And what a shame that would be. What a shame that would be. Um, I want to reaffirm what people in the Pentagon and, and throughout the government keep telling me that they really don't know who uh, Osama bin Laden is. Although they seem to have a fairly decent idea where Omar is, the, the former head of the, of the Taliban. And that effort continues. But where do we go? Where do we go after Afghanistan? Because sooner or later, we will get a handle on Afghanistan. And sooner or later, and hopefully sooner, we will get a uh, get the kind of mechanism that we can turn over to, to the Af Afghans to take care of their own security. Um, I think, first of all, when we do leave, because the conditions are right, we must make certain that while we don't have continuous presence in that area because of the dangerous neighborhood, we have continuous ability to reintroduce forces if something goes wrong. That is, continuous assured access into Afghanistan and into the region. That's very different than continuous presence. Um, but as the president said when, uh, when, uh, we were, uh, when we were subjected to that horrendous attack, uh, this war will not end in Afghanistan. So where do we go beyond that? Well, we obviously are in the Philippines already, and you, you know, we have special forces there. But you do know that this is very, very different. Unlike Afghanistan, where we conducted combat operations and have been involved there in that way. The few, very few numbers that we have in the Philippines, mostly special forces, are there to train and advise the Philippine army that is trying to deal with a relatively small but very vicious uh, Philippine terrorist organization that, to the best of our knowledge, has, has connections to uh, Al-Qaeda. And so uh, that's going to happen. Again, there's great indication uh, that we will probably have to have extensive intelligence operations in other countries, uh, maybe Somalia, and that has been mentioned in the news, uh, and other countries as well. But again, they will be very different than Afghanistan. So if Afghanistan is only the first phase of this operation, and the sort of operations we are now beginning to see in the Philippines and may see in other countries, uh, and surely in some form or another will be, will be the second phase. There is, however, a third phase, and that's the one that I really w I think we ought to concentrate on. Because the President made it clear in the State of the Union message that taking care of international terrorists and the kind of regimes like the Taliban is not enough. Because we have some rogue nations out there that either already possess or are bent on acquiring weapons of mass destruction and have expressed certainly a willingness to make missile systems and, and other things available to, uh, to other governments and spread that. Some of them support international terrorism, and some of them would, would gladly use those weapons if the opportunity arose itself against us and our friends and allies. And so he then uh, spoke about this axis of evil, uh, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea, as a signal, he says, to those countries that we will not stand idly by and let those people possess or try to acquire these weapons and the means to deliver them or make them available to, uh, to international terrorists. And immediately there was an outcry that uh, he's factually incorrect, that it is not really a, a uh, axis, evil. We all agree that it was probably borrowed by a speechwriter from World War II axis and evil from Reagan's days. And my view is we ought to not get hung up on this. Uh, there are more serious issues at hand. Um, yes, there are probably good arguments to be made that we ought to not have 
bunch them all together because they clearly are not the same and the different issues and so on. But let's make no mistake, they're all evil. And the question is, have we done more damage by having bunched them together than good by having put them on notice? I belong to the school that says, I think we've done more good by having put them on notice. Although I probably, if, if I had been asked, would recommend that we had mentioned them all three individually. Because we will have to deal with them individually, not, not as a basket of the same kinds. The danger, I think, is more than just having put them together. And in the end, it might prove to be, have been very healthy to have put them all together. The, the danger is really in Iran that we have undermined the, um, uh, the moderates. What, and clearly, we have undermined the moderates near term. I mean, all you have to do is watch the demonstrations that are ongoing, uh, get reporting from, from Iran to see that that is so. But the question is long term, does it really make a difference? Uh, or is there maybe some good in it? That the, the moderates in the long term will be able to, to get more strength and be able to change Iran from within. I don't know the answer to that. Neither do you, I suspect. And we will have different opinions, and only time will tell. The question in, in North Korea is, is different. I think it undermines some of the very good work that had been done in capping as, as imperfect as it was, nevertheless, the capping of the nuclear program in North Korea, and having obtained an interim uh, assurance from the North Koreans that they would that they would not further develop their long-range missiles to deliver whatever weapons of mass destruction, as long as we have an active dialogue going with them that could that could lead. To the, to the improvement of relations between the United States and North Korea, and secondary between the two Koreas. Have we really set that back? My limited experience with the North Koreans is that, like most Asians, the concept of face is very important. And that if you call them axis of evil and all of that, it does not enhance your chances of having a meaningful dialogue. That doesn't mean if you feel it necessary to, to publicly acknowledge them for what they are, and they are evil, then uh, you do that. But you've got to understand what that does to your, to your other objective. Again, we don't know the answer, whether that slows down any chance of resuming an active dialogue or not. We will see. There's one other aspect about, about North Korea. North Korea is almost like a child that, to get your attention, throws a temper tantrum. And whether that's sending in terrorists into South Korea to blow up something or whatever, I don't know. But I have a suspicion that if, unless some dialogue starts between us and North Koreans, pretty soon there will be some terror, some, some uh, temper tantrum that the North Koreans will, will throw to get our attention and to get us to change our policy. And again, we ought to not be frightened by that. But I hope that the administration now is looking very carefully and analyzing very carefully what kind of a temper tantrum we might see, and not just react to it when it happens, but already have a plan to either forestall it or to deal with it very quickly and very effectively when it, when it happens. Ultimately, John Charlie's view is that the one country where we really think that we might take military action against is Iraq. Not Iran, at least not in the short term, or North Korea. And I, I certainly don't have any inside information, but my sensing is that that's really the, the near-term issue. And so the question that you ask yourself is, is that the right way to deal with Saddam Hussein? Uh, the first Bush administration and through the two Clinton administrations, everyone tried to deal with Saddam Hussein by containing him in some way. And uh, so you have uh, no-fly zones down south and no-fly zone up north. We occasionally bomb him. We occasionally do, you know, well, impose sanctions. But the end result is 
that after all these years of containing him, Saddam Hussein has thrown out the United Nations uh, inspectors who were there to assure that Saddam Hussein was not building and uh, any uh, weapons of mass destruction. They have not been there now for a few years. We don't know what the condition on that is, and it's very dangerous. Because if, if there is a nut around, that's Saddam Hussein. Uh, and if there's, there's a vicious man who has no compunction about uh, being unbelievably brutal towards his own people, his neighbors, and our best interests uh, in that area, it's Saddam Hussein. And so I would, I would think that if here in a very short time, we cannot reach a diplomatic, satisfactory uh, arrangement that assures us that we know that the weapons of mass destruction programs either don't exist, in fact, or are being, uh, or the conditions don't exist where they could start again, then I don't have any particular big problem of saying then maybe militarily is the only way that we can ever change a regime there. I don't know what the administration will, will decide. But I, um, I'm hard pressed to raise an argument that says we ought to uh, that we ought to not consider that as an, as an option. But we ought to be clear also that Iraq is not Afghanistan, and the conditions are very, very different. Surely the Iraq military is at best half of what the military was during Desert Storm. In size, it probably is nowhere near half of what it was in competence and in readiness, because those sanctions and the inability to buy spare parts and so on all these years will have had an impact on the military. But still, it is a sizable military. In Afghanistan, we had the Northern Alliance. I think every effort we've made so far in, in, uh, in trying to organize some kind of an opposition inside Iraq that could be used as a springboard for that have been unsuccessful. Uh, there are people now who talk and uh, say that, but maybe, uh, hopefully, if we were to use military force, the Iraqi military would rise up and would, would come to our side. And that's, that's certainly a possibility. But hope is not a very good plan for an operation. And so we ought to, not, we ought to have some higher assurances of this happening than that. Now, I sound like, you know, I, uh, I'm op opposed to it. I'm not. All I'm arguing is there's still a lot of work to be done. And certainly, I haven't even begun to talk about trying to truly understand how the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and, and the Jordanians and other neighbors of, of uh, Iraq feel about it. But here I will tell you why it is highly, highly desirable that they be on our side in this effort. What is more important is that Turkey be on our side in this effort. But you will get Turkey, my sense is, only to side with us and be a major player if we, in turn, can give them an assurance that at the end of overthrowing Saddam Hussein, it will not result in the establishment of a Kurdish state. And having been the guy who was sent by President Bush in the first administration, to help the Kurds after Saddam Hussein had turned against them. I've lived long enough in northern Iraq and eastern Turkey and understand the Kurds enough to tell you that's not an easy issue to resolve politically, morally, and otherwise. And yet I have the sense, I don't know if it's true, but I have the sense that we're going to have to be able to assure the Turks that there will not be a Kurdish state, even if that means that military action will have to be taken against the Kurds. Uh, and we need to think that through. Yeah. Um, so, a lot has to be done. The time is running. The vice president is now scheduled to go to the region in about a month. And an awful lot of the questions I posed, my sense is the administration is working very hard to try to resolve before Vice President Cheney goes to the region. It's not undoable, and it's, I think it's very healthy that Saddam Hussein isn't sleeping very well right now because he knows we're, we're getting serious about it. But where it ends up, it's much too early to tell. So when you hear people talk, yes, we're going to do this or that, uh, take it with a grain of salt. 
I don't, I, I do believe when the president says they have not yet decided, that they have not yet decided. And so far, they've done things very astutely when it came to this war on, on terrorism. And I have no, I mean, we ought to not assume that all of a sudden they're going to stop being very astute about this thing and, and very reasoned about it. So I, I feel very comfortable. So that's how I see the challenges. But I'll tell you the biggest challenge I see. We'll resolve Afghanistan and we'll, we'll deal with, with um, the Philippine issues and so on. There will be ups and downs, and you need to be prepared for that. We won't be lucky that this will go always, and there won't be a casualty, so there won't be setbacks, and there won't be fights among those we thought we were, going, we were helping. And we'll resolve uh, the issue in, in um, Iraq. And we might even resolve the issue in, in uh, North Korea. But all of that will take time. And the end of that struggle will not be like pre the end of previous struggles. You know that. The 20th century was, it was a rich history of, of conflicts ending with a noticeable something. World War II, the signing of the surrender that, uh, that uh, MacArthur took on deck of a battleship. Uh, even even the end of uh, the Cold War, the, the, the tumbling of the, of the wall. In between, we had the end of Vietnam, helicopters taking off. There's always some event that knew, that told you then, whether we won or lost or tied, that it's over. I don't think this is going to be like that at all. I really don't. I think what, over time, it'll be more, what will count more, it's not what American forces do, but what the other side won't be able to do and won't do. Uh, and the war will come to an end when there's been a long series of absence of terrorist strikes. They will never end. Terrorism is here to stay. But there will be an absence of, of a long period of time. And when, and when, all those plans that we are now putting in place as a result of the tragedy of 9-11, military, military changes, home defense changes, financial changes, financial institution, all of those things, um, civil defense, dealing with, with uh, uh, anthrax and other things that might be false. When all of those things are in place here in the United States and internationally, because we cannot be secure here if terrorism can strike somewhere else and terrorism can move around somewhere else. And it doesn't take a genius to tell you that this is a very long time. And the challenge, therefore, the biggest challenge perhaps for us is to make sure that we stay alert and focused and support our administration through this very, very long time until all those things we need to set in motion are finally set in motion. That we don't get tired and declare victory before all that needs to be done is done. That, folks, I think, is our ultimately our greatest challenge. And I... Uh, I wish I could stand before you here and tell you that and I'm confident that that'll be so. We're very good at fighting the fight. We're very good about uh, looking the bad guy in the eye. We ain't so good in having patience and perseverance. Um, and I hope the president is right when he says, yes, after 9-11, we are a country of resolve, of patience, of perseverance, and we will get it done. And I hope that all of you here uh, will help him make that happen. And only then victory will come. Thank you very much. We're going to have questions, and when you have questions, go to the microphone. There are several that have been submitted up here. Uh, I have one, and that is, uh, as this country re-examines uh, what went wrong on 
September 11 and looks at its uh, failings. Uh, was did, uh, but did it occur to you that 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 there was a principal failing in the network to not to determine uh, where we were, that we didn't have any alert, or is that just 2020 hindsight? I, I don't know. Uh, those are issues that are very difficult to answer unless in a time immediately preceding 9-11 you were there and you were reading intelligence reports and, and the traffic and the cables and participating in discussion. And I, by that time, was already retired, so I don't know. My sense is that the intelligence community knew and reported that we were coming very close to a terrorist attack. But we did not know uh, when and where and who. But there, there, was enough, there were enough electrons in the ether out there that the intelligence community was picking up to indicate that something was happening. That, in fact, they reported. They reported that to the White House. They reported that to the uh, Defense Department, to the State Department. And no one in those agencies claims that they didn't have that report. They just didn't know what. Now, I do know that when I was chairman, never once did I think that a threat to our nation would come w from an airplane, commercial airplane, full of fuel, hitting one of those buildings and use that airplane as a fuel explosive, almost as a weapon of mass destruction. So unless they had some indication of that, and there's, so far I've not seen anything, I doubt that they knew. They knew there was, we, and they issued warnings. Uh, and we probably all said, well, until you tell me where and who and when, you know, I, I got to go to the office, you know, I, what do you want me to do about it? And I, so we will know the answer to that when serious, what, you know, after action reviews are conducted. Not to find out who's guilty and who to hang, but so we can fix things. For. And let me, t if I may digress just a minute, let me tell you why this is so. Some time ago, some time ago, many administrations ago, there was a massive reorganization of our intelligence community that took us away from human intelligence that is, guys running around and infiltrating organizations to, to technical means, as they call it, that is satellites and other ears and eyes that would tell us what is happening. And why? Well, two reasons. One is we were then involved with the Soviets, and what we really needed was not some spy running around the battlefield. We needed to have the eyes and ears that could tell us when tanks were beginning to move and when ships were gathering. So, and that's best done by satellites and other ways. The other one was that it was considered dirty business in the, um, to, to infiltrate these kind of organizations because those kind of terrorist organizations learned quickly that you can keep an American agent from infiltrating if the price for admission is that I tell you go out in the street and cut the throat of the first person you see. And if you do that, then you can come join you. Well, you, you know, you know the, our not only moral standing, but also our laws. It was just simply not something that we as a nation wanted to tolerate. And therefore, it became almost impossible for us to infiltrate many of these organizations because they had learned what to do and what not to do. And so, under the best of circumstances, we don't have the agents operating in those, in those terrorist organization networks that could otherwise tell us what happens. And someday you're going to have to make a judgment, and this government will have to make a judgment what kind of a nation we are and what it is that we wish to do. And how do we get information from inside terrorist organizations if we cannot become terrorists ourselves in order to infiltrate them? I have a few questions here from Alderman Terrace, which probably will take us a long time, but I'll just feed them in. I'll start the first one going and then we'll go to the questions and we'll try to accomplish all of them. The first question is what causes you to think that the U.S. can get a handle on Afghanistan when the Russians and the British have never been able to do so? 
Oh, I think because we have learned the lessons from, from previous failures, um, and because we have the capabilities that others don't have. Uh, we operate now in such a way because of our high-tech capability to know what's going on and to do something about that which we know that's going on, that we do not have to have massive ground forces that get bogged down somewhere. The Russians don't have those capabilities today. Uh, the Brits, certainly in years past, when they were there during their three wars, didn't have them, so they had no choice. Uh, the Russians would dearly like to deal with Chechnya the way we can deal with the Kosovo or with, with Afghanistan, but they just don't have the capability. And so I think we have learned, um, and we have the capability and the tools to deal with those issues differently that make it less likely, not impossible, but less likely that we get bogged down, uh, and only time will tell. But I feel fairly comfortable that we can do that. Yes, sir, if you state your name and your occupation. Uh, Chuck Connor, Captain, U.S. Navy, retired. General, we've seen uh, the limitations of land-based air and the utility of sea-based air in the Afghanistan conflict. I recall that when you were chairman, there was a big model down the hallway from your office that was the uh, brainchild of Admiral Owens, which was, for the benefit of people in here, very large um, mobile platform that would be the size of 10 aircraft carriers that could be stored at Diego Garcia and assembled to take air fo entire Air Force wings. And of course, the minute Admiral Owens retired, Navy sent the SEALs in one night to get rid of the model. Do you think we need to examine a concept like that uh, in, the, in light of our recent experience? When I was the chairman and Bill Owens was my deputy, if I didn't believe in it, I surely would not have had him put this thing up in a hallway. So. I believe in innovation. I believe in uh, exploring these things. But I've also learned that just because it's a good idea and on the surface it looks good, doesn't mean it's going to work out. Uh, I think where we are now is where we have to make a judgment whether we want to put some money into this concept and try it. Why is the Navy opposed to it? Well, it's a practical matter. They need to, that money to, um, to maintain their carrier battle groups, to buy more ships so they can replace aging ships, and they will fight bitterly any money that's, that draws away from them. If we can give a money that comes out of somewhere else other than the Navy budget, I bet you they'd be delighted to, to see if that works. After all, the aircraft carrier was invented in that same sort of environment, and the Navy was quite happy to try that. But it's an issue of money. Okay, the next lady is very familiar to us. I'm going to ask all the people who are lined up to state their questions cogently and concisely so we can get to them. Chris. I will, honestly, I won't give you a speech. I'm Chris Chabella Long. I'm uh, formerly the chair of the executive committee of City Club, and I'm a board member now. Um, I was very much taken with your commentary, not just about the military, which I admire terrifically, but rather your story of how you got here. And it strikes me from my experience of working in Poland for the United States government back from the late 80s through the 90s or through a large, large part of the 90s that part of why successes went on in Eastern Europe was because people were trained to somehow make a civic society. Will we not have to do that in Afghanistan? Will we not have to have a long-term relationship with the Afghan people in order to build a civic society? And do you think we're prepared to do that? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. But I may, in my own mind, I make a distinction between the military staying and doing things, whether that's rebuilding uh, bridges, churches, uh, schools, or whatever, or civil organizations, or for that matter, contractors doing those things. The military has, it's, it's almost like flypaper. When you put them there somewhere, things tend to, to they're, they're very difficult to extract them. And, and so people learn this buzzword about exit strategy and so on. But it's very different when civilian organizations go. For instance, we can, we can give uh, added resources to the United Nations, uh, World Food Bank, all of those things that people who are trained and equipped to handle this kind of nation building. It is, my objection has always been to the military being asked to do that. Um, 
Will it have to be done much more so than in Eastern Europe or Southern Europe, where we now try to, to do that in a place like Albania and so on? With, I mean, Albania is a sophisticated country compared to, to Afghanistan. And so um, surely it will be. But let us find a model where we are away but have assured access to come back when things get out of hand. Where the Afghan government, through a police force we train and an army we train, provides a modicum of security and stability so the civilian organizations from the outside can operate there free of fear that their throats will be cut at night or that they will be uh, abducted to get some money. And they can then operate and build the churches and the, and the schools and the hospitals and the roads. That's the kind of model I see. And presumably that people will learn to be citizens of a democratic society. Yes, but remember what kind of a, if, if, if our prerequisite is that this become a democratic country as we define democratic country, never mind a Jeffersonian democracy, but I think we will be in for a rude awakening. This is a, this is a country of, where democratic institutions have very little meaning. I think that we are, ought to insist that it be a government that respects human rights, that it respects the rights of women, uh, that takes care of its own, uh, you know, all those sort of things. But let us not get too hung up on the institutions that we try to be modeled after American institutions. That won't come for a long, long time, if ever. Second question from Alderman Ateras, in your opinion, as the incident of September 11 forced us to police the world? Um, I, don't, I don't like the, the notion of us being a policeman of the world, and the world doesn't want us to be a policeman. Uh, but some things only we can do. Um, it's not that because we have more tanks or planes or so on, but sometimes only we can be the galvanizing force behind others joining and us in a particular endeavor. The fight against terrorism is one of this. I, I don't want to name any countries or anything because I don't want to appear, that to appear on the evening news or something, but there are countries in which an incident like this could have happened. And it's not because of their own unwillingness or callousness to this event, but they could have never galvanized the world in a fight against terrorism. I mean, you can, you can think of zillions of countries like that. And so the, these incidents come, and you say, if not the United States, who? Look at, just look at what happened in the Balkans. A war broke out between the factions in, in, in Yugoslavia. Europe saw it. Europe tried to do it. The United States, meanwhile, decided that we were going to take a short holiday from leadership after, after Desert Storm. And if the Europeans wanted to do it, why don't they do it? And we saw the results. And when the United States finally decided to get involved and, and brought NATO in, we didn't change the troops on the ground there. Those were the same British, French <laughs> troops that had been there before. We just gave them a different political leadership. And all of a sudden, with a matter of literally weeks, that war was over. That's the, that's the difference. That only America can do. So will there be occasions where the United States will have to be the policeman? Yes, but not in a sense that you think. But the United States can never, I think, not ever, more often than we'd like, cannot say, I'm just going to stand away. Doesn't mean we have to do it all the heavy lifting. Sometimes we do, but we have to provide the leadership. That's the definition of a superpower, which I don't like, but that's the fact. We're the most dominant, influential nation in the world today. And with it come responsibilities. If you don't like it, then we've got to anoint someone else. Next. <laughs> my, my name is Bob Tucker, and I'm a confused practicing lawyer who finally came to understand that the first step toward knowledge is the admission of ignorance. 
And you made a distinction that I would hope that you would clarify for us, that when you said that it was time for us to consider an approach to the problem that deals with distinguishing al-Qaeda from Taliban. And uh, I will confess, as an admission of ignorance, that I would appreciate a clarification if you would enlighten us as to that distinction. Uh, the Taliban is an illegitimate government of the country of Afghanistan. I say illegitimate because only one country in the world recognized it and the others recognized the government was overthrown. Um, so there might be equally bad guys and so on, but they represent a government of a nation. Al-Qaeda is a collection of individuals, many of them from the Arab worlds, uh, the Arab countries, uh, but people from as far away as Europe, Asia, and so on. I mean, the Taliban fighters come from all, I, I will not, 40, 50 different countries. When I was in uh, Bosnia, some of the biggest problems we had were Al-Qaeda fighters who fought on the side of the Muslims in Bosnia. So Al-Qaeda is, is, a, is a, this, this morphous international organization. They happen to have made their home in Afghanistan, and the Taliban took him in. Now, the reason they took him in, because El Osama bin Laden was one of the great supporters of the Taliban people when they fought against the Russians. And so when he left and went to the Sudan, and then the Sudan threw him out, and he came back to Afghanistan, after a while we said, you got to throw this bum out. And their answer was, wait a minute. We are today a, f a country free of the Soviets because people like Osama bin Laden fought on our side, gave us money. As a matter of fact, Osama bin Laden spent quite a bit of his own money building hospitals and roads and other things for the Afghan people before this happened. So they are both, in the end, ended up to be very evil forces. But they're very different in that sense, uh, as to who they are. That, that, I don't know if that helps at all, sir. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, General. Thanks for coming today. My name's Rachel Cunningham, and I'm a journalist. And I have a very brief question, and that is, what is your assessment of the recent reports that the Iranian president um, has kind of put an international call out to al-Qaeda members to come to Iran and to infiltrate and have influence in Western Afghanistan? I don't know anything about the reports. I'm on very thin ice. I would hope to God that that is not so, for the sake of Iran and for the sake of what we need to do in a region uh, and for any hope of uh, building a dialogue between us and, and Iran. And from what I know about the president, um, I, just, I just hope that's not, that's not so, because that would be very, very bad news for the people of Iran. And there are some who have worked very hard to try to, stu to start a dialogue with the people of the United States. That would be one of those tragic, unintended consequences, if it were so. But I'd rather walk away out of here believing that that's not so. Uh, the general has to leave very shortly, so I think we'll take probably about two questions, is that right? Very quickly, and then uh, we know this next man will advertise his wares as an excess television commentator. So go ahead, Mr. Berkowitz. Uh, Jeff Berkowitz, head of JB Consulting Group. Uh, general, you said, I think, uh, just, just said today that you, you think we should consider taking military action against Iraq. And I'm wondering, would you, if you were President of the United States, would you take that military action to change that government in, in Iraq? Would you do that now? And secondly, would you also take military action in, in Yemen and, and, and Somalia and perhaps Syria to remove what we know are terrorist networks that are housed and nurtured uh, by those governments? Um, if I said what you say, I said probably a, a, a better way to say it one ought to not exclude right now doing that. Uh, and it's 
it is in a way, I think, useful if, um, if Saddam Hussein understands how close we might be to making that kind of a decision. Because if there's any hope of reaching a diplomatic resolve of, of this issue that is us getting a handle on weapons of mass destruction. It is, I believe, only when Saddam Hussein thinks it's unavoidable that something very big and very explosive is going to end up on his head. Um, the other countries, I, I think, uh, first of all, would I as a president <coughs> make the decision now? I certainly wouldn't make the decision now as a president because, as I said, there's still entirely too many unknowns. And until you resolve those issues and you, you have all those in, in, uh, before you, can you make a logical decision whether you, in fact, in the end, will take a military action? The other countries, I would, uh, I would say, uh, let us not overload our ambitions right now unless we really have to and take it one step at a time. One of the great danger in Afghanistan is that we move too quickly somewhere else before we've completed what needs to be done in Afghanistan. If we were to go into Iraq, it's going to be difficult, heavy, take lots of resources, and we ought to consider what we're going to do next only after we finish that. So I am much more in withholding decisions. You might have a broad plan what you think of them, but withholding decisions until you have to make them and look at things one at a time so we don't lose sight of, and do not fail to complete one before we start the other one. So I, I, I withhold judgment on that. Now, the chair regrets this, but this will be the last question necessarily because the general has to, has to leave. So would you give your name and question, please? Thank you very much, general. Uh, my name is Timuel Black. Uh, you can see I'm an older person and a very ordinary person that is very concerned about these extraordinary events in this extraordinary world that I live in. And my concern is uh, how long and how much do you think we can carry on this, in quotes, I haven't considered this a war yet, I consider other kinds of names for it, how long we can carry this burden uh, alone, uh, where do our in quotes again, allies come in, and what roles do you think they ought to play since you indicate that we are the only superpower in the world? Uh, can we manage the distribution of some of that that would enable us to take some of the load off in the minds of, of, of American people? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we have done a remarkably good job. How long will that take? And how will this division of labor change? A, no one knows. No one knows how long this will take. We only have a vague idea how it will help, what the world will look like. And I try to describe that to you. And that's pretty wishy-washy, but I think that's how it's going to end. And we surely don't know what the need for the next coalition will be. What if something happens tomorrow that we find out about a cell operating in some country in Africa or Latin America? It's only at that time that we will be able to know what the ability of that country is to do something, how much this assistance, that assistance. So each one of these will be built at the time that they occur, will change once we've done the first two steps and so on. That's what is so frustrating about it, and that's why the president tried, I think, tried to caution us against thinking that I'm going to finish this on this day, and that's what it's going to look like, and that's what it's going to cost like, and that's how many will get. This is very different. Now, whether that's a war or not, I. I don't know, it's a conflict, surely, but we have never had one like that before. No one has had one, and we don't know. And this is my, pretty that's the greatest challenge, because it is so unknown and so wishy-washy, and we Americans like it to be clear-cut. Will we still have the will five years from now to do this?